All right, everybody, welcome back, and uh, we're very excited. We got a great pinball team here to whiz bang is going to talk about their new pinball game. I'm sure you all know Greg Ferris and Dennis Nordle, and we're so happy that you guys could come and talk to us about your new project, and we're just going to turn things over to you, and then we'll have some questions uh, time later, okay? Thanks, Tim. We had a feeling that uh, free happy hour would, would intrude on this a little bit, but uh, thanks for showing up, um, all the sober people. Um, so yeah, I'm Greg, that's Dennis, uh, the pen and teller of game design, except he's the tall, silent one, and I'm the short, talky one. Um, so. We, we put this presentation together, and I say we loosely, um, because... He did, he did it. <laughs> because Ed said, hey, what do you guys want to talk about? And I said, I don't know. And he goes, how about we'll call it whiz-bang style? And I said, yeah, we can do that. So um, what we're going to do is kind of take you through the evolution of our career together, a brief history of that, and then blending into uh, the Wonelli project uh, from the start, uh, when we started it back in 2009, up until today when we have prototypes uh, from the Stern factory on the show floor here for the first time. So, um, has everybody had a chance to play Wonelli, by the way? Everybody's had, all right. That's one thing that we've been talking about for a few months now, is people are really gonna have to see and play this thing to really understand what it's all about. Um, a lot of our followers have, have seen the, the whiz-bang version of the game, uh, the four that we built, but they haven't seen, um, you know, they, a lot of people haven't seen it. So for those that have never seen it, um, we're hoping it's a pleasant surprise uh, compared to what they might have thought it could have been. So anyway, with all that, let's uh, take, take this journey together. Um, so whiz-bang style is kind of a nebulous idea. Um, we're both kind of crazy knuckleheads that just put ideas together and, and what we think might be entertaining to us, we hope is also entertaining to a bigger audience. Um, for years as a kid, I went to the drugstore and bought Mad Magazine uh, without my mother knowing it and I'd bring it home and kind of have to hide it um, so that, you know, my parents didn't know I was reading Mad Magazine. Uh, I was highly influenced by that magazine because it's, it, it's satirical, it's parody, uh, it's not just a comic book. I, I was never a huge fan of standard comic books, Marvel and, uh, and all that. Um, the superheroes didn't do it for me. It was, the, it was the biting satire of Mad that got me interested in doing any kind of art. So um, that's us in our younger years, um, back when we were experimenting with uh, things. Um, w you know, w when you look back on the history of what we've done together as a design team, we, we enjoy working in pairs. Um, so before I met Dennis, uh, I started at Bally many years ago. Uh, these are two early projects that I worked on uh, before I ever even knew what a De Dennis Nordman was. Um, and, and, you know, that the, the Harlem Globetrotters was my first. Fathom came a little, little bit later, and Fathom has become quite a collector item over the years. And I appreciate everybody's, uh, you know, response to that art package because it was definitely one of my favorite as well. Um, this is me working without Dennis after I met Dennis. Uh, so this is me cheating on Dennis uh, with Steve Ritchie, so to speak. So. Um, you know, and I, I get a lot of comments about this art project, too, because everybody th thought I did a pretty good job, although now I see that people are doing um, 
you know, updates to this back class and stuff like that, which is fine um, to each his own. That's that's fine. But uh, this was a, a fun project to work on with Steve. He was reluctant to work with me, by the way, because of my history with Dennis. He said, I don't want any funny stuff on my game. I said, okay, I promise. So then we did No Fear, and this was a chance for us to actually do some funny stuff. Um, so if you played the game, you'll know that uh, Steve is the voice of Skullboy, um, and I am the voice of the, guy, the reluctant, uh, you know, guy that has to jump out of an airplane and stuff like that. So uh, we had fun working on that project together. And then Revenge from Mars, I cheated once again and worked with George Gomez uh, on... on uh, Revenge from Mars, and, and uh, you all know that's a historical piece that, uh, you know, it's, it's an amazing game, and, you know, we all know the history behind that, that it, you know, Pinball 2000 and where it went and wh where it didn't go. So, um, you know, but that, w that was fun. There, there is a crushed Edsel in the corner of the back glass because at the time our uh, CEO... I overheard him tell somebody outside the company that was visiting one day, yeah, this project could either make it or it could become the next Edsel. And I was like, you son of a... So this is Dennis before he met me. Um, this is Dennis doing a project while he was still in college, I believe, right? Yeah, this was a project I did. I was in uh, product design at Ohio State, and this was a project I did in my senior year. And um, the uh, third quarter of my senior year, I injured my back, and I had to have back surgery, so I couldn't take my courses for another year. So while I was recovering, I built, uh, I built the model on the right side in college, and then I built, so while I was recovering, I built the full-size version um, during the summer. I lived at my grandmother's farm, and I converted a little shed into a, a wood workshop, and really all I had was a radial alarm saw. And uh, I built that cabinet, and I, I took it to uh, Schaefer Distributing in Columbus to take that picture. And um, they knew, Ch Chuck Farmer used to work at Schaefer Distributing, and at that time he was the president of Bally Pinball. And, um, so I got an invitation to bring it out to Bally to show it to them, and uh, I showed it to Bally and Chuck hired me. And also at the same time, uh, my wife Barbara was Chuck's secretary, and I met her when I came out there. So within a year we were married after we met. So that was a good time for me. How convenient. <laughs> um, and, and you'll notice the base. This is not a standard pinball cabinet with legs. So, hey, flash forward to 2015, and we have a crate out there that has no legs. Although, if you buy the game, you'll get legs if you want to put legs on them. But there you have it. That, this, this is an early, early that, you that's, know, that's development. That's where the pedestal idea started right there, because I was just trying to do something a lot more modern looking. So these are just some projects uh, that Dennis worked on uh, without me. So the first time Dennis and I ever kind of put our brains together was on a project called Party Animal. Um, there, there was another Greg Commit game in the engineering department at Bally, and I told Greg, I said, you know what, you should call this game Party Animal, and we could do a whole theme about that. And he was like, no. So Dennis overheard that conversation. He goes, I'll do a game called Party Animal. And so Pat McMahon was the next available project artist. So Pat McMahon worked with Dennis, and, and we all kind of worked together to kind of bring this to fruition. That was the hardest game for me to design because I used up all my good ideas on Special Force and then I didn't know what to do after that. <laughs> so, you know, we took it, we always take our ideas one step further. So, you know, the, when you look back on Party Animal, uh, we did a Party Zone game a few years later and instead of a jukebox, we hired a DJ and called him Captain Bizarre. And then we met Elvira, 
And that's what really, you know, brought us together as uh, a team. A, that's it, that's the game that made us a real team. Yeah, we 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 really gelled on that, and uh, it was it was a great project. She was a great license to work with. She was so into pinball. She was into. Um, any idea that we had, she did voiceover work freely, you know, very freely for us, and, and had fun doing it. And uh, she couldn't be a better person to work with. We just, you know, we have a great time when, whenever we work with her, and we worked with her twice. And she wants us to work with her again. She wants us to. We'll see. Yeah, we'd like to too, maybe. And then, you know, we really went off on a tangent. My favorite story with Dr. Dude is we were at a conference table at, at uh, Williams, and Steve Kordick was still uh, kind of the figurehead father figure of, of game design at that point. And we did our pitch for Dr. Dude. And all I remember is Steve sitting at the end of that conference table going, I don't know what the hell you guys are talking about, but it sounds good to me. Go ahead. So we got Steve's blessing, and Dr. Dude was the result. The, the sketch on the left was my early sketch of the good doctor, uh, and it, that was a little bit too far out there, so I, I toned him down and, and made him a little more standard. But, it, you know, if you think about it, that was like the Mad Magazine version on the left, and on the right was the pinball version. We wanted to do a story on the back glass, uh, like a little comic book story. Yeah, which was uh, problematic for our European um, distributors because they wanted to try to uh, translate. translate everything on the back glass, which was all colloquial, colloquialisms and, and slang and stuff, so it, it didn't quite translate very well. Um, party Zone, of course, was the, the epitome of the party games. You know, you couldn't take it any further. We were done with the party theme, and, and this was it. This was the end of the party era for us, and, and that's where we ended out in the Party Zone. And then we got to work together again with Elvira on Scared Stiff, which uh, to us, uh, a lot of people in engineering didn't think we should do another Elvira game. They said, you did it once, you don't need to do it again, don't even bother. And we were like, no, we want to bother because we have more ideas. We've got an enhanced system. We've got dot matrix now. It'll be a much better game, and it, it'll, it'll, it'll talk more. It'll be, you know, the choreography will be great. Our music is better than it was. So they, they let us go, and uh, the result was scared stiff. And we're, we're both very proud of that project, even though it was a critical time in the history of pinball, and uh, Dennis got laid off during that project, and it was, it was sad times and angst-ridden times for everybody at, at Williams. Anything else? That's my wife's cat on the play field, on the back glass, I mean. That's my wife's foot on the back glass. <laughs> That's my idea to expose his wife's foot. <laughs> well, that, that game is bittersweet for me because it, it's one of my favorite games that I did, but I got laid off before it went into production. So that leads us to, you know, how do we get to Whizbang Pinball? So um, way back in uh, early 2009, uh, we were reunited at the Northwest Game Room Show, and um, we, we heard everybody talking about custom pinball. And we thought, wow, you know, we've been around quite a while. It would be cool for us to think about doing a custom style game rather than everything we've always done under the roof of, uh, you know, of a, a corporation. So um, we went out to breakfast uh, one morning because I couldn't sleep one night because all I could think about was doing a custom game with Dennis. And so you might say I was sleepless in Seattle. So we had a really healthy breakfast at this cool restaurant in Seattle. And, um, you know, I said, hey, Dennis, I got this great idea. And he liked it. I pitched it. He liked it. And so we flew home really fast because we couldn't wait to get started on it. 
So, and if anybody has seen this part of the presentation before, I apologize, but hey, it's good stuff. <laughs> So we anyway on, on the way home we just chatted about ideas and we wrote down really fast. hundreds of ideas of game themes that we wanted to do. They weren't all good. Sure they were. So we flashback. We don't start whiz bang pinball yet. We gotta do a flashback first. So Dennis and I reunited at a at a museum in southern Illinois where they presented the art of pinball. And it was an, it was an excellent show. It was put on by a, a real museum with a real museum curator. And, and he did an excellent job of presenting pinball as an art form. And Dennis and I hadn't seen each other for 10 years, literally. I mean, we were, we were not, you know, we, we didn't work together. I was working at Midway Games. He was working elsewhere. He was working at Stern, but we, we hadn't seen each other for quite a while. So Dennis found uh, uh, a wood rail that he really liked, and he bought it at this show. I liked it just because I liked the odd cabinet and because the guy was going to give it to me for a really good price. <laughs> Hey, that's pinball. So um, he brought it home, and it sat in his shop for since 2006. Well, when the guy delivered it, the back glass was broken in half, so I got it for even better price. Yeah. So that's, then, yeah, it was just sitting in my shop. Yeah. So when w going back to Seattle, when we came up with this idea for custom pinball, he said, "Hey, I got an old wood rail game we could use as a step off point." So that's what we did. It was kind of. We weren't planning on production at the time. We were just thinking, "Oh, let's do a cool work of art. We'll do a cool cabinet, and we'll do some cool artwork, and we'll do one game, and that'll be fun." So we brought that one game to. Uh, Ken Walker, and uh, he was our local Team EM guy. And if you don't know Team EM and you have an EM game, you got to get to know these people because they're all very good people. They share their knowledge. Uh, they're, they're great people. So um, if you're into EM games, they're, they're the people to connect with. Anyway, Ken really helped us through that first stage to make sure he got that game running. Uh, because we weren't sure what we were going to do with it. We just knew we were going to use it as some kind of a Frankenstein experiment. Yeah, and it wasn't working when we got it, and Greg and I had no idea what to do, how to make it work, and within a couple hours that we got it off the truck, Ken had it running. And I took these close-ups because, I, you know, they're charming because it's, it is from another era. You know, we've got a hand-scrawled, uh, uh, probably a factory person that, that put the date on there, uh, 413.56, uh, with their initials, uh, probably after they inspected something. Uh, and I just found the, uh, the buttons on side of the cabinet was interesting because, well, who doesn't know that? But, you know, at that time, I guess it, it needed to be spelled out. So we've actually brought that into the production piece, and on the bottom arch decals, it, there are arrows that say, flipper buttons on side of cabinet. So Dennis came up with the pitch. Uh, he had this vision um, you know, of everything. And, and I got to tell you, as designers, we see things differently. And, and we, we, we look at things differently than some people might. And a couple weeks ago, I was having my coffee reading the morning paper. And I, I saw these two ads like right next to each other and I was and I was like wow I'll bet the guy at the newspaper who lays out the page wanted to have a little fun and see if anybody would catch this so so to me that's like you know the guy at the newspaper has this boring layout job but he decides to put these two ads next to each other just to have a little fun so, you know, as designers, we try to see things that maybe somebody else might not see. And, and what, the reason I say that is because, you know, we, we look for inspiration when we come up with stuff. Everybody says, do you just dream this stuff up? Where does it come from? Well, we get inspiration from everywhere. And, and so Dennis's pitch, the part of his pitch was fruit crate labels. 
he, he really felt strongly, and so did I, that fruit crate labels, the history of those pieces, they're, they're beautiful. They, they were works of art, and they were meant to grab attention at the market for all these guys that were buying their fruit. They wanted somebody to look and see, hey, I want that one because it, it's pretty, you know? So that's kind of where, where the whole thing started. So we added, you know, fruit crate labels plus classic pinup art plus classic pinball art, highly influenced by Roy Parker because Dennis said... Roy Parker always had happy people in his back glasses. Happy people. So that was, that was a point of inspiration to make sure that everybody in the game was having a good time of some sort. And then with my skills uh, as, as a, you know, as an artist and, and Dennis's skills with tools, um, you know, that's what became Wonelli Big Juicy Melons. So we, you know, that, that was all of our inspiration. That's all the history of what brought us together and what led to this point. This is Dennis's sketch that he showed me after the pitch. And he said, here's, here's my concept for the cabinet. And I, I was immediately taken by it. And I said, of course, that's what we're doing, you know? And he just used, like, you know, just some generic fruit crate labels. We, we knew we were going to make our own brand, but we didn't know what that was just yet. But, but that, that was the inspiration. And as you can see, it's pretty tight, uh, the final, uh, you know, the way it came through. That was my first rough sketch, um, just putting something on paper. You know, we discussed sweet, juicy melons, uh, and then after Dennis pitched sweet, juicy melons, I said, well, it's got to sound like a brand, though. Sweet, juicy melons just sounds kind of generic. So I said, what if, like, there's a guy on a horse and he's getting bucked off, and, and it's more like, whoa, Nelly, big, juicy melons, you know? And, and that's where big came from because Big seemed more appropriate than sweet, so. Um. And this sketch was when it was a two-player game. We decided, and the only reason we decided to make it a one-player game, so that there would be more room for artwork. More room for artwork. Thank you, Dennis. So we'll start with the garage phase. Dennis, is, Dennis took the cabinet and stripped it down, and a lot of labor-intensive stuff going on here. Um, you know, fortunately, the weather was good in Chicago at that time. So you can see on the right side, if you look on the left side, you can see the extended front of the Continental Cafe-style cabinet. And on the right side, I've already got that cut off, and I've got the taper cut off of the cabinet, too. And then uh, this... This was our, yeah, I built, the, um, I built the base crate and put the framework on the cabinet. And so that's our very first cabinet. You can still see the Continental Cafe artwork on the door. On the left side is where I was distressing the wood for the, um, for the crate sides. I took a torch to the wood and, and burned it. And then I had a big six inch wire brush on a drill and, and wire brushed it and weathered it and kicked it around in my gravel area for a while and stomped on it and then uh, uh, finished it. I, my, I finished it with just um, watered down latex paint. I did it. I did a gray wash first, and then I did a black wash and wiped it off. I love that Western Ho <laughs> label. Yeah, so that's like the base crate before it had any slats on it or anything. Um, so I don't think we're risque at all compared to these fruit crate labels. And then, as it, uh, that's pretty low res, but that, that was like the first pass at trying to make it look like there was fruit inside. Right. And then before, you know, the back box was completed, we just threw the old back box on the game just to see, you know, okay, are we getting close here? Um, and it's always good to hit those mile markers, you know, and feel like, okay, progress, good, let's move on, you know. Changing it to a, a one real game, that was very problematic for me and Greg. We had no idea how to do that. But who's the guy from California that helped with that? 
and then Carrie Emming helped us. Um, the yeah. Team EM guy, Steve, was Steve, that it? Yeah, Steve Charland. Steve Charland. From Team EM. He told us, oh yeah, that's easy. We can make it a, a you know, a one score, a one player game. Yeah, and, th and then he went off on a tangent and said, and we can do this, and we can do this, and we can do this, we can do anything you want. And we were like, okay, well, let's see what happens. Because we had no idea we were going to do solid state. In our heads right now, we were just doing one EM game. This was me when I was still a starving artist and I was 50 pounds lighter than I am now. And this shows the difference between one of the uh, games that we acquired uh, versus the, the definition of the actual vision uh, to the right. Um, you know, it's the same, same cabinet, but with Dennis's handiwork. So we showed it at Expo, and um, a guy came up to us and said, I know where there's a Wondelli for sale, and we said, well, we want it. So he was from Minnesota. I met, him, I met him in Wisconsin, halfway between my house and his house, and he brought us this beautiful pink game. Oh, sorry. So we couldn't do this by ourselves. We, we brought in help. So besides Ken Walker, we also had the help of Mark Wayne. Mark worked with us at Williams, and he was instrumental uh, on getting um, a lot of things completed uh, on time and, you know, and, and that kind of thing. And he's, he's a huge fan of electromechanical, so he, he and Ken together really did a, a great job of converting uh, the game from the, the Continental Cafe game to the l layout that Dennis came up with. We're very happy that we had their help. Well, actually, we weren't even going to change the layout. You know, we just thought, let's just put some new art and put this cabinet, and we'll sell it, and we'll be done. But then we started thinking, wait, we're game designers. We should do something different here. So um, I relayed out the play field. I think the one on the left was my first layout. And um, Mark Wayna is the one that convinced me that I should stack the pop bumpers closer together. I didn't think EM pop bumpers would have enough power to get the action that you get in a modern game, but he said no, he thinks there would. So actually, the, the, uh, Mark is responsible for the pop bumper layout on this game, and um, it was a great idea. There's tons of great action in the solid state game right now. So we gave him credit. If you look at the game today, the uh, pop uh, the rollover switch in the center of the pop bumper area says 10 Wayna lit instead of 10 when lit. So that's in tribute to his idea to put the pop bumpers together in a group like this. So this is uh, just some of the you know, tasks that uh, we had to do. All the wiring from the original EM game had to be marked clearly so that we could get it back together again when it converted over to Dennis's layout. Um, we had, you know, progress on the cabinet, and we were experimenting with uh, the color of the, the side label to see which one would play better, and we had family and friends look at it and, you know, say, which one do you like better, and all that good stuff. Um, and then we got a, a first flip to Milwaukee, um, which, you know, was instrumental uh, in getting some more progress. It's always like... Getting, getting more progress behind you so you can move ahead uh, in design. So this is where we learned a few things about the layout. Um, and we had people uh, test flip it. Uh, this is where we met Carrie Imming from uh, Minnesota. Carrie. Uh, Carrie's the guy in the middle there to the right of the kid in the striped shirt, and the kid in the striped shirt is his son. Yeah, and so when Carrie saw the game, he said, you know, I've had this idea for a long time to do a bus system that could convert um, EM games into solid state games, and I want to help you guys, and I, I, I'm very interested in helping you guys, you know, bring this to reality and turn it into a solid state game, and we were like, Okay, we don't know what you're talking about, but it sounds good to us. Let's go. So he, he jumped on board and, and was able to get the other three of the four games we built into a solid state world. Uh, at that same show, Roger Sharp was there. He played it. He had a couple of suggestions of, you know, put another rollover on this side so when you go up the, the left side, there's, there's, it's like an orbit shot, so you get another scoring opportunity there. So, you know, thanks to that, there's, there's a uh, rollover on the left side. So all these small incremental changes, you know, lead up to the bigger picture, which is great. 
And uh, we attracted a pretty good crowd at that first show. People were wondering what the heck it was. Um, and, you know, uh, thanks to Jim Shelberg, we got a we got a nice uh, picture portrait for the final result. Uh, we sold three, three games um, that were solid state and one was still an electromechanical. Um, the electromechanical is owned by Steve Sabota out in California and he was, he was adamant about owning the first one. He was one of the first people that realized our vision. When he saw us at Pinball Expo in 2009 with a base crate with a cabinet on top of it, he saw that and understood where we were going with it. So he, he was an early adopter to this, to this whole idea of Woe Nelly. And at this point, we were still thinking, we're just making a forerun work of art, and that's all, that's all the further it was going to go. So once we started selling these off to these guys, we also were talking at shows like this to other customers, other potential customers, because people were like, well, how many are you making? And we said, well, we're making four. 400? No, four. You know, so they were like, oh, so how much are they? And we told them a price, and they're like, oh, okay. So what we learned from all that was we, f we felt we had a potential market for this game because people liked playing it. The, the solid state games had music, had sounds, and they felt like, wow, this is fun. I, I want to own one of these too. So that's when we started talking to the buyers and saying, hey, would you mind if we took this one step further and turned it into a production game, if we can swing it. And everybody was on board. Everybody said, that's great. You know, we, we're, we're not opposed to that at all, because uh, we wanted to give them that opportunity to say, hey, I'm investing in this. I thought I was buying one of four, but no, they all said, no, you guys, you, you have a vision. If you, if you have the opportunity, go for it. So we're very appreciative of the first four owners. So now the transition to Stern. So um, the first thing we had to do was get Gary to buy off on this. So we brought it in and we explained it to him and, and I think Gary was, was on board pretty quickly. He loved the fact that it was old school, the fact that there were scores, score numbers on the play field, printed on the play field. And um, he just, you know, he just loved it. So uh, the reason it took so long to get it from this point to the production line is because they had to figure out when best to, to fit it into their schedule. And also they had planned on putting it on the Spike system. So Spike was still under development when we pitched this. So uh, by the time Spike was ready, um, then we were able to start you know, the process of getting uh, Wonelli onto the Spike system. Uh, this is Darren Sheldon. He is one of our first four buyers, and he is the guy that literally um, let us borrow his Wonelli for two years while Stern engineered it. So again, another you know kudos to a very generous uh, owner and, and pinball enthusiast for helping us out in that direction. Uh, Tom Copera, uh, he was our mechanical engineer at Stern. He, he brought all the drawings from Dennis, uh, all his cabinet sketches, his, and, and took measurements off the cabinet and really brought this to um, fruition. Again, Mark Wayna is now a Stern employee, so uh, Mark is still part of the process bringing it to the finish line. Tom, I think Tom Copera did a, a tremendous job taking this cabinet from me building four to taking the design and the engineering to enable Stern to build a large number of games and make it mass production. Yeah, because you got to remember, uh, Dennis Frankenstein, an old cabinet where Tom had to start from scratch and, and re-engineer the cabinet from scratch. So it was a lot of, a lot of effort there. Um, John Trudeau, when he first started at Stern, his first task was to take Dennis's CAD drawing and turn it into a solid, SolidWorks drawing because we work at Stern on SolidWorks on all our playfield design now. So, you know, thanks to John Trudeau for helping us out with that. 
So the first white wood gets built, and uh, you know the only flippers laying around are standard stern flippers. So um, those aren't going to work. So you know, obviously we, we knew that, but uh, somebody put those on this play field just to get started. And this is where we changed the gobble hole to an eject hole. And um, I know there's some EM guys that said they wish they'd rather have the gobble hole, but we thought in today's market with today's players. Most people have no idea what a gobble hole is. And in fact, when we took it on tour around the country to different shows, if it would go in the gobble hole, people said, what happened to my ball? Where'd it go? I don't know. So yeah. we decided it's going to be better to leave it out. And from this first whitewood, it's already different from that because we really needed that ball to settle in there and feel like, you know, that shot is very makeable. And when it was just an eject like this, uh, it bounced out. It didn't, it didn't sit in there nicely. So Tom had to re-engineer that and get that uh, to work properly. So, you know, then the cabinet, that, that was the big hurdle for us because we knew uh, our cabinet vendor was going to look at us sideways because of the complexity of this. Uh, it's just not what they do every day. So um, it is a work of art unto itself. Uh, this is, you know, one of the four games that we built. And uh, I got this great picture to show the details and, and you know, the wood grain and the richness of it. So, um, you know, it was very important for us to build a game that was as, you know, almost as cool as, as the first ones that we built in the shop. This is the first stealth cabinet that came in. We called it the stealth cabinet because we didn't want anybody to know what we were working on. So uh, we painted it black, and uh, uh, no, nah, I'm just kidding. It came from our vendor that way, and we, were, and we didn't tell them to paint it black, but it just came in that way. So that's the first uh, test from uh, our cabinet company to show us what, what this could look like in the real world. Uh, this is early on with the play field sitting in the cabinet. We have spike in the back box, uh, the, the spike system, um, ready to run the game for us. So, you know, once it's in shop, we've got a lot more people working on it. We've got Reina Cortez does our uh, cable design, and she's, she's amazing at designing every cable that goes into every pinball machine at Stern. Uh, she's been at Stern for about uh, three or four years now, probably about three years, um, and she does a great job. We've got uh, Dave Cadeau that w runs our, our uh, build-up room. And uh, he, he does a lot of work on every game to bring each Whitewood uh, up to speed and, and get, get the first games running so we can test shoot and, and get it to a programmer for early programming. Uh, and then, of course, a lot of people are familiar with Pat Powers. Uh, you know, if you've, if you've had any trouble and called uh, the 1-800 number, I'm sure you've talked to Pat at some point in your life. And then Paul Mandeltort, um, you know, he's no longer working with Mark out uh, at the booth. He's now at Stern, so he's helping out um, at Stern from the inside. This is uh, modifications we needed to make. So back glass, it's not the same as our first back glass. It grew in size. We added some lights. We had to uh, adjust for the spike system with the LED lighting that we have. The cabinet begins to take shape. The early backlash, the first backlash from the games, obviously is short. It doesn't fit, so we had to adjust the size of the backlash. The crate, the fruit crate at the bottom starts to come together. This is a press proof where we go and check colors and make sure the colors are appropriate. So, um, I called tweakage because that's where we had to change the uh, um, we had to change the gobble hole. Uh, so you know we we spent a lot of time shooting that early whitewood to get it to uh, come together. So this is where we take a break. <coughs> I call this Lake Ratherby because that's where I'd rather be. Even though pinball design is fun and exciting. This is where I'd rather be. So let's just take a moment. <laughs> <laughs> Whose feet are those? Those are my feet. Oh, God. Thanks for asking. Yeah, thanks for telling me.
Are we done? Okay. All right. We'll move on. But, you know, the, the whole thing is to a great design team needs support. There's mine. 30 years. Woohoo! 30 years of hell. No, I'm just kidding. We've had it. I'm talking from, you know, my side because I'm never home. So, um, we, she's great. Andy's here today, and we've had a great, you know, life together, and she understands the needs of pinball. And I understand the needs of what an absent husband brings to the table. So we, we, we've worked it out, and, and she's great. We have, we have a lot of fun together. All of us are very fortunate with our wives. My wife and Andy used to be good friends working at Bally together. They're still good friends. And they're, and they're still good friends. And, and Steve Ritchie's wife, Diana, and Mark Ritchie's wife, Trudy, they are the best women you could ever imagine because we're all a little wacky. And these women keep us grounded. So without our wives, I don't know where I'd be. Well, without my wife, I don't need, I don't need their wives. But without those women, I don't know what we'd be doing. All right, now we switch back to wood. So we get the first samples in from the company that we're buying the trim from. And they show us the first samples, and we approve. And we say, well, the edges have to be nice and smooth and all that good stuff. And then all of a sudden, Stern, one morning, wakes up with a bunch of wood, you know? So there it is. It's, it's the, the first shipment of the trim comes in, and, and the Stern receiving dock goes, whoa, what are we doing with all this? So we had to get that over to our, our cabinet vendor. And then our cabinet vendor starts putting it all together. And, uh, you know, they, the, the, base, the game cabinets uh, with the speaker hole, we did add a speaker, a base speaker for uh, the game. Uh, the trim gets uh, colored, stained uh, appropriately and, and weathered. So it's very close to what uh, Dennis uh, envisioned in the beginning. Um, we went over to the cabinet company and spent a lot of time working with them to make sure that they understood what we were looking for. And we were probably a uh, PITA to them, but you know, that's the way it is. You, you, if you want to get something done right, you got to do it yourself or tell somebody that this is the way we want it, right? So, right. Yeah, everybody needs to understand that this is real wood trim. This isn't fake wood, this isn't vinyl. It's real solid wood stained with Minwax stains and finished with a, a, a satin lacquer overcoat. This is uh, Brad Grant out in California. He was one of two people that have so far successfully created their own homegrown Wonelli. Um, we did have extra parts of play fields and plastics and back glasses that we sold off to people, not knowing that they would be interested in actually building their own. But uh, they, two guys so far have found uh, Continental Cafes and use the spare parts that we sold them to create uh, their own homegrown version of Wonelli. Uh, electromechanical, not solid state, but uh, and kudos to them for going through that labor to, to take it that far. Those are our three solid states together when we finished uh, in 2012. We wanted to get a picture of them before we shipped them off to their uh, new homes. Uh, this is an outdoor photo shoot we did with the game with a, a stand-in for Melanie um, and, and the big red truck that's on the back glass. Um, so here we are at the Stern factory. We're, we're screwing them together. These are the first prototype games that, are, that you see at the show here. Um, you know, things are coming together. It, to, for us to see this in the factory was exciting. This was an exciting day for us to, to walk down the assembly line and, and go to see the first play fields being printed. Um, you know, it's just uh, amazing that going from the garage to this, you know, we're just so happy and so excited that we can share this game with so many people now. Um, and even Dennis got involved with more staining, uh, you know, at the factory, just putting some finishing touches on stuff before we shipped uh, the games out uh, to the shows. Um, we've got <clears throat> on the line, you know, looking at the first play fields on the line, exciting moment. Bigfoot shows up to give his approval. <laughs> wow. 
<laughs> Uncanny. Is that scary? Yeah. <laughs> Don Thorne uh, is our production manager uh, on the on the uh, on the floor, and uh, he oversees all of production. So you know he's out there checking things out, making sure everybody's doing their job. Uh, Al Dale is our operations manager. Um, he he's instrumental in making sure that everybody everybody in the building is doing their job. Um, you know. Uh, these guys were caught off guard. I don't know what they were putting inside that base crate, but um, we'll find out someday, I guess. Jack Benson is our programmer. He's uh, our newest and youngest programmer. He's got a lot of great ideas. He's a great pinball player. He's an enthusiast. He, he loves the sport. So he's excited to work on this project because it's fresh, it's new, and it's exciting. And it's ex he, exciting for him to work with a couple of old guys, and he always makes sure he reminds us how old we are we are. Stephen Martin, I hired Stephen a couple years ago at Stern. Uh, he does a lot of our graphics, our production graphics, and our uh, advertising graphics. Uh, again, we, we had Jim Shelberg help us out and, and do the brochure photographs for us. So um, we, we thank Jim for helping us out with that. Um, we've got, uh, uh, and we don't usually drink at work. That was at some banquet. Um, Jerry Thompson did our audio for the game. He's, he's put, he's put uh, his voice into it. He also worked on Mustang. You'll hear his voice in Mustang frequently. And he's also uh, the character of the uh, Papa Leroy on this game, and he's also um, the radio DJ. We decided to have a, a radio DJ in the game as, as a, uh, you know, broadcasting live from the melon farm, so to speak. Uh, and Jessica Rowe is our Melanie. Uh, we got hooked up with Jessica from Jerry Thompson. Uh, he found her and said she'd be perfect voiceover for Melanie. So um, if you can't hear the game out there, but when you can hear it, uh, the, her voice is the perfect, perfect voice of Melanie. So, you know, we say cheers. Uh, we, we might even have a beer someday, you know. Um, we needed crushed beer cans, so there it is. Uh, we've got crushed beer cans now. Um, and we hope to add a non-crushed beer can into the coin box uh, for any buyers of the game so that they can see what it looks like before it gets crushed. Um, but yeah, we'd love to have a summer blonde ale uh, produced from, uh, from this someday. But Stern is not in the business of making beer, so we'll have to hook up with somebody to get that done. Um, and of course, the you know, I have to put the pitch in. We have uh, swag available at the Marco booth. It's also on the Stern website. And uh, hey, thanks for having us. Th thanks to Ed for, you know, allowing us to give you uh, this insight into the behind the scenes of making of Woe Nelly. We, we enjoy what we do and we enjoy talking to all everybody that is into pinball. Um, you guys are amazing. You, you, you fuel us to do better and bigger things. So thanks for that. And I want to thank Ed and all the Texas Pinball Festival people for inviting us here and all of you for coming to our show. But we've been treated so great. I got this great gift basket in my room and I drank most of it before I came down here. And I'm, I'm still enjoying some of it right now. And I've had enough to make me think I'm pretty awesome right now. <laughs> but I want to say something about the play field. Um, here's here's my, my theory and my analogy. The, the games that Stern is building today are like top of the line, best, include everything you can think of. And to me, they're like Formula One race cars. And there's only a very few people in the world that can handle a Formula One race car. And if we want to attract new players, they can't start that way, because if any of us get into a Formula One car, we're going to die. And uh, new players are intimidated by games like that. So that's why we think Woe Nelly is a good starting point for new players. And I'm hoping and I'm thinking that this game could do good on location, because new players can walk up to it and play it and not feel intimidated. It's, it follows the classic rule of game design, easy to understand and difficult to master. So that remains to be seen, but that's my theory of this play field with our modern electronics. I guess we'll open it up to uh, questions.
Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Johnny. Of the game. Talk about the serviceability. Does it have a lockdown bar? How do you get to change out the lights and stuff in it? Yeah, the lockdown bar, um, it has two latches on it. And the play field also has two latches on it. But it's a solid maple lockdown bar, so it'll, it'll last as long as the old wood rails. I, I'm not concerned about damage to the trim on the cabinet because to me that's just going to give it more character. And if the lockdown bar gets a few little nicks or, or somebody scratches their initials into it, that, that just gives it more character in my eyes. So, um, and with, I don't know anything about the spike system. Greg can maybe talk about that. But to me, the game looks very serviceable. Yeah, uh, the hood was up today, um, and you know it's. I, I'm an I'm an art director, not an engineer, but uh, for sure, uh, you know it's all LED. Uh, the the lighting on the playfield is all controlled lighting. Even the general illumination is all controlled. Uh, those are board-based lights, so um, you know the need to replace lights is is diminished highly with LEDs now. So, and the back box is all LEDs. We do have two flashers in the back box too. We're not, we haven't implemented them yet uh, in the code. And there's also two lights that light up the base crate um, on the bottom. So when you put the game on a base crate, there are LEDs that will light up the uh, front decal of the base crate as well to give it a little more you know, uh, illumination and stuff. So the serviceability should be pretty easy. If you, if you, if you want, I can lift up the game and, and show you the bottom and, and show you the inside of the back box. Uh, and you know, if anybody wants to see that, uh, we can do that. There's no ramps to clean. <laughs> We're going to have um, three different game settings. That, that's our plan. We're going to have an easy setting, a medium setting, and a hard setting. So the easy setting will be pretty much like the Continental Cafe played. And um, in order to keep people from getting tired of it, if you start I mean, to get 5,000 points on the game right now, it's pretty difficult. If you start rolling over the game, you can switch to the medium setting, which has some little harder rules. And then from that, you can go to the hard setting. So I think we're going to call these settings uh, simple, sassy, and the hardest setting is going to be called stern. <laughs> Guys, first of all, um, absolutely beautiful as an overall package. I was stunned when I first saw the game. So much better looking than in pictures. Thank you. Um, one thing that really kind of got to me though was the design of the bumper caps and I'm curious why go with a flat design as opposed to the more traditional domed EM style cap well the cap it's the cap itself is injection molding injection molded the daisy cap is injection molded the cap on the top bumper is flat plastic but the cap on the on, on the all four pop bumpers is injection molded but it does have a flat dome in, instead of a, a flat plastic instead of a dome and greg can talk about that yeah it was it was a cost thing um the, these parts are not readily available, and our bill of material was creeping, just as every other game. And you know, we 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 figured out where this bill of material needed to be, you know. And and once we got to a certain point with tooling costs and everything, we we had to make some concessions. And you know, early on, we weren't sure how many concessions we'd need to make going from garage to factory, right? So. We knew we would be making some, so th in this case, um, you know, we the one of the things about the top bumper is that on the original game, it's what's called a dead bumper, um, and and a lot of people who aren't familiar with dead bumpers think, oh, hey, that bumper's broken. It's not. It's not doing its job. Uh, so what we've done is we've turned that into another sunny day on the farm, and and when you play it in a location where you can hear it, uh, you're, it's going to be loaded with myriads of sound effects that relate to being on a farm with uh, animals and and other ambient noises and stuff like that. Because we wanted to give that life, so we're flashing that to make sure people know they're scoring something off of it. But but going back to the original question, anything that was 
was molded just was going to be cost prohibitive. So we, we tried to get the, the original daisy caps as close to it as possible, but give it our own, own signature with a plastic insert with, you know, kind of a themed uh, melon uh, graphics in there. So I, I don't know if that answered your question, but, you know, it's... The daisy caps are dimensional. It's just the center point is right. not domed. Right. The center part isn't domed. Yeah, you know, we've heard that before. The, the top bumper is just a flat plastic, but again, it, it became a, a cost issue to, you know, buy, actually go out and buy the, you know, any kind of retro cap and stuff like that, so... I have to second the art uh, quality is great, the layout is great. Um, any consideration for on the audio to have a more pure EM sound to it? Um, we've talked about that. Um, again, bill of material, we started with real bells. And the concern was if this game is going to have a coin door on it and it's going to have real bells on it, uh, will operators be like, it's too loud, it's too noisy, and I can't turn that down. So, um, again, we, we costed uh, the cost of the real bells out, decided to put them into the package, um, and we as a team have talked about having a setting that would be more of a pure EM setting. Um, we've gone to great lengths to bring this up to 2015 by including voiceover and music and, and, the, and the whole you know, 2015 experience from an audio-visual kind of feel. But if, if a purist out there wants to turn it back in time to something that's more uh, appropriate for an EM, uh, we can certainly provide that setting and, and bring down all the other music and everything and just have, you know, click EM and then have the bells and, uh, and, and all that stuff. So the wiring is actually in there uh, for bells. So uh, people could add their own bells if they wanted. Uh, but, uh, you know, that was something that uh, early on in the bill of material costing process we we had to remove all right well we want to thank you guys for being here we know you guys probably have some more questions so ken and dennis if y'all don't mind we'll if y'all just hang out over here somebody might want to ask you some more questions or get an autograph or something we'll go ahead and set up for our next seminar but guys how about a hand for whiz bang thank you thanks thank you very much Thank you very much. Great. Thank you.